everyone, John the Morgile here, checking in for section three of Flat Earth Short and Sweet. In the previous section, we looked at a couple of problems with solar eclipses, namely the diameter of the moon's shadow being way too small for the alleged 2,000 mile diameter of the moon, according to the Ball Earth Theory. In this section, we're going to expand on that point and show further discrepancies between measurable reality and the ball earth theory. The astonishing truth is that the shadow of the moon never comes close to the 2,000 mile diameter shadow demanded by the geometry purported by the ball earth theory. Again, the moon's shadow cast upon the earth during an eclipse is unique as it is the only event where tangible physical evidence from celestial bodies is laid at our feet for direct measurement and scrutiny. Celestial evidence doesn't get more straightforward or simple than this. To ignore unquestionable basic physical evidence such as this, which opposes one's belief system, is intellectually dishonest and, again, is the opposite of science. Uh, furthermore, to invent wild apologetic theories like the divergence of the sun's rays in space to allow for the moon's shadow to be ridiculously small is a signature tactic of the globe Earth proponents. While this single point is sufficient to completely falsify the globe Earth model, there are even further aspects to solar eclipses which contradict some of the foundational tenets of the globe Earth theory. As stated previously, the sunlight is supposedly converging upon itself at some point in space. Diverging from that point and striking the moon to allow for an inverted shadow which cannot be demonstrated in reality. This, by definition, demands the sunlight not be traveling towards the Earth at parallel angles to one another. Were the sunlight indeed parallel as claimed, then the moon's shadow should be pretty much cylindrical and should thus cast a shadow with a diameter of approximately 2,000 miles. This is in direct contradiction with Eratosthenes' method to calculate the Earth's circumference. You see, in order for Eratosthenes' method to hold true, the light from the sun must be striking the Earth parallel to one another. In practically every flat Earth debunking video or argument you'll find, the condescending mention involving the ancient Greeks knowing the Earth was round over 2,000 years ago, citing Eratosthenes' experiment as the earliest estimate of the world's circumference. They even claim that Eratosthenes' method was accurate to within just a few hundred miles of the current accepted value. So the big question here is, how could Eratosthenes' values be so accurate, according to modern standards, verified by the liars at NASA, if the primary condition of parallel sun rays is falsified by the divergent sun rays demanded by solar eclipses to create the tiny shadows? Alas, we find two cornerstone proofs of the ball earth theory that are in complete contradiction to one another. So we have a major discrepancy here between two of the most common arguments used by Globers to support their position. They say, uh, we've known the earth is a ball for thousands of years, and Eratosthenes knew the earth's circumference way back then. Well, here's the thing. If Eratosthenes' assumption that the sun's rays are attacking the Earth in a parallel fashion is incorrect, then the rest of his math to approximate the Earth's diameter would have necessarily been incorrect as well. For it would have been founded upon completely erroneous values. Ergo, any triangulation extrapolated from that point would be dead wrong. What's more, Eratosthenes would have been completely unaware of the refraction of light, which means the numbers would have been even less accurate. We now know that the apparent azimuth and elevation angle of the sun in the sky is absolutely not indicative of the actual position of the sun, but is instead an apparent position that is only subjective, again due to conditions like refraction, magnetic refringence, and others. Since refraction wasn't even acknowledged by science until the 1600s, it's safe to say that Eratosthenes' value for the Earth's circumference must have been extremely inaccurate. 
This is very strange indeed, for modern physics claims that his values were extremely accurate. So what does this mean? Does it mean that Eratosthenes' value was somehow carved into the scientific record as an unquestionable axiom? Indeed, Eratosthenes' value for the Earth's circumference is supported by circumstantial evidence, although, as we've shown in this video, the underlying assumptions that form the foundation of his method are completely incorrect. Eratosthenes' method demands that the light waves from the sun must strike the moon parallel to one another which is debunked by the standard explanation for the impossibly small shadow cast by the moon during an eclipse. Let's not forget the lack of understanding of refraction during Eratosthenes' era. It was assumed that light always travels in straight line paths. We now know that this is absolutely not the case, and light waves will change direction due to a variety of conditions. Using Eratosthenes' method, it's possible to prove a flat table is actually a sphere. Such a demonstration was conducted by Dr. Zach. I'll put a link to the entire video in the description, as well as a card right here. What he did was basically house a light source within a convex lens, which is intended to represent the sunlight passing through the Earth's atmosphere. The light source was placed a few feet above the table. Then he placed upright nails at specific intervals on the table so the nails would cast shadows upon the flat surface of the table. Now using the same assumptions and methodology as Eratosthenes, the flat table can mathematically be proven to be a spherical object. Two of the primary assumptions which must be granted going into this experiment are first, you must assume that the flat table is a sphere and two, you must assume that light always travels in straight lines. These are the very same assumptions made by Eratosthenes for his experiment, which allegedly estimates the circumference of the Earth. Using the very same data in terms of the sun's azimuth and elevation angles indicated by the shadows cast by the sun, if you assume the Earth is a plane as opposed to a sphere, the results will be completely different, although mathematically correct. Furthermore, since we now understand that light does not always travel in straight lines and will bend or change direction during its journey from the sun to the eye of the beholder, we must admit that no matter how meticulous our measurements and documentation may be, there are unknown variables which will render the results of such calculations as inconclusive. Without knowing the refraction index through all the different layers of atmosphere which vary in density and temperature, material makeup, etc., Eratosthenes' result would have necessarily been extremely inaccurate. The fact that Eratosthenes' value so closely matches the modern accepted value for the Earth's circumference raises some very serious questions about the honesty of the national space agencies who concur with Eratosthenes whom we already know must have been wildly incorrect with his estimate of the Earth's circumference. That is, of course, unless we do away with the assumption that sunlight is converging upon itself to apologize for eclipse shadows, in which case we have a major contradiction on our hands yet again. Such blatant discrepancies between two of the cornerstone, foundational, so-called proofs of a spinning ball Earth speaks volumes to the validity of both. Science has a choice between discarding their current accepted value of the moon's size and distance, or they can keep the ridiculous diverging sunbeams theory and get rid of old Eratosthenes' method to measure the Earth, which would essentially prove that the field of science has been wrong about the size of the hypothetical ball Earth for 2,000 years. This is, of course, because Eratosthenes' method could not have yielded triangulation results anywhere near accurate. Either way, it's one of those damned-if-you-do, damned-if-you-don't scenarios. If we ditch parallel rays and Eratosthenes, it exposes NASA as lying about the circumference, at least as the standard value is indeed very close to that of Eratosthenes, which must have been way wrong. On the other hand, if they keep old Eratosthenes around and concur that sun rays are parallel to one another across the globe, 
then we must conclude the moon's diameter is equal to or less than the smallest recorded shadow diameter during a lunar eclipse. In any case, it's very obvious that there is a major discrepancy in terms of the ball earth theory and measurable reality. The ballers would love to have their cake and eat it too, so to speak, in a sense that in order for Eratosthenes' method to work, you must have parallel sun rays striking the hypothetically spherical Earth. And on the other hand, in order to have a very teeny tiny shadow of the moon, you must have anything but parallel sun rays. So with that, we're going to wrap up section three of Flat Earth Short and Sweet. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you'd like to support this channel and help us keep making videos, your support is greatly needed and much appreciated. You can make a one-time contribution to PayPal at www.paypal.me slash themorgyle or a recurring monthly contribution through Patreon at www.patreon.com slash themorgyle. I went to hell.